Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below and help support the channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Jeannie Feldman on the podcast. She's coming to us all the way from Miami, Florida. We're just saying those two words is making me just so jealous. I mean, I, as, as everyone's probably aware of, I'm in Minnesota where nothing's, you know, you're never expected really any happiness when it comes to weather-wise, but I don't want to get into that too much, but she's an IFBB Olympian and she's, you know, here to share her journey with us and here to talk all things real bodybuilding. But Jeannie, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I know this is basically self-torture for me, but what's the weather like in Miami today? Oh, it's about 90 degrees, a little on the humid side, rained a little bit this morning, but the sunshine is out again. So it's a nice day. See, that makes me feel a tad bit better because even up here, once it gets above 80, that's like, for me, it's like, oh, that's a, little, that's a little too hot. So it makes me feel just a little bit better, even though it is like 30, it's like 29 degrees. I think I, that, I'm, I'm, that's what my thermometer says right now. But, but again, you never know, but I don't want to get too much into that because I am working on a winter woes podcast where I'm just going to, you know, spend 10 hours just talking about all the worst winter stories I, I've ever had. And it's, it's going to be a sob story just to, just to boot, but before I get into that, Jeannie, why don't you give us your backstory first off on what really inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now? Well, I started off as a, as a CrossFitter. Um, I did that competitively for about six years. Yeah. And I made it to regionals. But I mean, I love CrossFit and I, you know, I'll always be a CrossFitter. But um, I kind of, you know, got tired of you know, my, beating my body up so much and um, wanted to take a little bit of a break from that. And my husband is a, um, well, my husband is my coach and um, he's always been in bodybuilding. He's been doing it for over 30 years. And so I figured, you know, let me give it a shot. I actually went to one of his shows, one of the shows here in Miami, the Southern States uh, championships. And he did that. And um, I don't know, made me think, I was like, I can do that, you know? got to be easy. You know, you get up there, you pose, whatever, put a suit on, you know, how hard can that be? Little did I know, you know? So, uh, yeah, so that's where it started. And, um, I, I decided to do that same show about a year later. And, um, that was my first show and I qualified for, um, nationals in that show. And, um, I did nationals November. It was in November of that year, which was 2016. And I got my pro card right away. Yeah, so I was very happy about that. That was my actually, my second show. And actually, when I did the Southern States, I went in as a figure competitor. And then for nationals, I guess, you know, I um, everybody was telling me, you know, the judges that I should, um, I was a little too muscular, that I should bump up to physique. So um, uh, for nationals, I actually switched to physique. And that's when I got my pro card. And I've been going ever since, you know, I did my pro debut a couple months after that. And I placed third. That was in the Karina Nascimento. So let me get this straight. You won your figure card and your physique card, pro card, both in your first show in that category. Well, no, I did. I did my first show as a physique competitor and I qualified for nationals because oh, you have to go to nationals yeah, 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 and then yeah. nationals is where you get your pro card. Okay. I was going to say, cause like if you did it like back to, but still that's, that's probably the earliest that we've heard someone win both are pro. Yeah. That's, that's. That's incredible. And I got to ask, so with CrossFit, is that where you got your traps, basically? Yes. Yep. The first exactly. thing, the, the first moment you said CrossFit, I was like, oh, so that's where she got them. Because the moment that she picked up the phone, everyone, I was like, oh, my God. that's oh, that, Yeah, I yeah, yep, yep. That's the defining thing about CrossFit. But yeah. And I've had a lot of CrossFit people on, too, and it's an interesting way to, to get it. I've went to a few training sessions myself, but I'm 6'3", so that lifestyle doesn't really fit too well with being this that tall. I mean, oh, it's you're not. you're too good with wall balls and rope climbs. Yeah, <laughs> but when it comes to those kipping pull-ups, you know, I'm a little, there's a little too much okay going yeah. on for 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 that but i mean yeah like you said crossfit i'm the thing that's fascinating to me about crossfit though is that i mean a lot of them look like they could compete you know in bodybuilding you know the, tomorrow but it's just a different it's different muscles that you're really working because there have been some photos of like crossfitters like doing like a front double buy and their arms their biceps don't even look like regular buy it's just because they, they train them differently but do you think that that background in CrossFit really helped you when it came to develop those bodybuilding muscles? Or do you think that it was kind of a struggle sort of changing up the way that the muscles looked for bodybuilding? Yes and no. Um, uh, like you said, my traps definitely CrossFit. My back, which is one of my best parts, 
is uh, definitely was, was developed in CrossFit. Um, one thing that I, um, I I had to stop doing CrossFit because I always, you know, I argued with my husband that, you know, I wanted to keep on doing CrossFit and bodybuilding. He's like, you can't, you have to choose one or the other. Number one, you, you know, you, you do uh, a lot of repetitions and you, you burn out the muscle and you eat through the muscle so you can't grow. But uh, what happens is you use a lot of your obliques too. You know, you do toes to bar, you do a lot of uh, shoulder to overhead and stuff like that. So that develops your obliques. So I don't know if you, when you look at CrossFitters, if you notice that they're very blocky. Well, they have, they have those abs that come out like a foot from their stomach basically too. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I can't have that. I have to have a B taper. So, and plus, you know, I didn't, you know, want to risk getting injured. So I kind of had to put CrossFit on the back burner, but I don't know if I'd be able to go back and do that now. It's a whole different, my body's changed, you know, so it's, I don't think I can do those type of movements anymore. Do you think that that endurance helped you out when it came to bodybuilding though? Cause I mean, if you're in CrossFit, like you said, you're, you're going until basically failure where bodybuilding, it's somewhat similar, but I mean, you, you aren't really going till death basically. Yeah. But it has um, helped me so much because it has helped me in my mind to be strong and to be able to, to endure the pain that you need in order to push yourself to that point that, you know, you can do that last rep, you know, or, you know, that and mentally make me strong like that. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I'm grateful that I started there because it taught me a lot and where, and where I can apply that to bodybuilding. That's what separates a good bodybuilder from a great bodybuilder is those last few reps, you know, and just being able to push through that. But obviously, you're, and you're, that pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're you I mean, you have to have basically a loving relationship of bringing yourself pain and, and harm. So, you know, that's a whole different that's a whole different topic. But the nutrition thing with CrossFit is probably vastly different than it was with bodybuilding. What were some of the big nutritional changes that you made when you made that switch? Yeah. Oh my God. I'm a night and day. I mean, with CrossFit, I mean, I, I, I would, I would do three, maybe four workouts a day. And I'm not talking like, you know, small little workouts or one body part. You do like really tough workouts, maybe an hour or something, or maybe they're short workouts, but like very, very tough workouts. So you need to fuel your body in any way. I mean, I ate fats. I, ate, you know, Oh, you're eating, you're eating for fuel as opposed to bodybuilding where you're eating for growth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly that. So yeah, you have to refuel your body a lot more carbs. I mean, I eat a lot of carbs now, but it's, you know, but you can throw in a lot more fats and stuff like that. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's very different, very different. Whereas here, you know, you you, with bodybuilding, you have to measure everything, you know, you're, you're carb cycling. I didn't carb cycle when I was crossfitting. I just ate whatever I wanted, you know, which is one, one thing, like I had a job where I was doing manual labor when I was like 18, 19, when I was in my freshman year of college, where it was, you know, just working outside and stuff where, yeah, I would literally just, I didn't gain that much muscle at all just because, yeah, I was eating, you know, have to eat like 5,000 calories a day just to keep up with it. You know, it was, it, it It's just, yeah, it's something that is just absolutely ridiculous. But one thing that I love to talk about in this podcast is genetics, because so many people in this day and age that are on like Instagram and whatnot, they always say, oh, I want his arms. I want her abs. I want their back. People don't realize that you can only be the best version of yourself. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people just aren't able to grasp mentally. And first of all, I mean, you don't know how a person got to that level. I mean, we have had some genetic freaks on here where, I mean, they they just look at a weight and then they gain they gain muscle and you're like, okay, that's not, that's not fair. And then we have some people that, you know, they could train for 20 years and they wouldn't, you know, gain as much as, as much as they'd like. But I always say whenever someone first gets started in the gym, they always have that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And they have that one body part that just legs behind that they have to train to oblivion. I mean, my back also along with you from, you know, working in warehouses too, where I had to load, you know, trucks, basically full boxes while I was working out, you either got a really nice back or you quit. Those are basically the two options that were presented to you, but being six, three, my legs and my lower body are just absolutely shot where, I mean, I could train legs every day. I always said I could inject pure muscle into my legs and they wouldn't gain an ounce. You know, it's just calves are another big pet peeve where it's like, don't even get me started on that. But what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? Okay. Well, my back was definitely easy to my upper body period. is just, you know, very easy to develop, you know, my legs, you know, have to catch up with my upper body a little bit. That's where my quads and my hamstrings too, you know, that's what the judges tell me that I need to work on more of a quad sweep. Yeah, but definitely my legs. Yeah. Well, so I have to ask this then, because as someone that is also struggling with legs, what do you look to in training for legs to help them grow? Because I'm taking everyone's advice here and I'm literally just piling it up and trying everything. Well, oh yeah, my gosh. I mean, I've tried everything, but I've noticed that with me, I can train legs heavy, but I don't get that 
pump in my legs. Like I don't get that blood flow in my legs. So um, I do a lot of pause holds, squatting, you know, holding it for a couple seconds and, you know, doing a couple reps and then hold. Um, what is it called? Pause under tension under. Time under tension. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, just playing, you know, when it comes to squatting and everything, getting very low, maybe not necessarily going so heavy, but getting that depth, you know, and focusing on that and just focusing on as far as the hamstrings, it's something that you really, you know, your mind connection, uh, your connect, your mind muscle connection, you really have to just pay attention, go a little slower and pay attention to what you're doing. You know, I have to really feel that squeeze. Like when you do your bicep, same thing as your hamstrings, you know. So I'm kind of like learning that a little bit more as far as, you know, coming from a CrossFitter that just does rep after rep. That was a hard thing for me to do, to slow down my reps and think about what I'm doing. So that took me time. So I think that's what it is. Yeah, I did one workout time under tension for legs and I thought it went great. I was like, oh my God, I feel so great. The next morning I got out of my bed, took two steps and I couldn't walk anymore. And I was just like, oh my God, this is. So yeah, that's, I mean, and it's always, you know, it's one thing that I'd love to get on this podcast is that, you know, you're never going to be able to find exactly what works best for you because it's always ever evolving too. And the moment you think that you find that your body's going to get adjusted to that and you're going to have to constantly change and mix things up, which, which is what makes this sport so challenging. And which is why I think so many people, if they, if they were to get started, just even getting in great shape, they get frustrated and leave because they say, Oh, I've been doing the same thing for two years. And you know, I saw a great first six. Yeah. I saw, I saw a great first six months. And then after that, you know, I was making a little change, but not that much change at all. It's like, because you need to find things that really mix things up for you. But one thing that isn't talked about as nearly as much as it should be talked about, I don't even know if I've ever heard anyone ever even talk about this, but it's the most important thing when it comes to recovery. It might be the most important thing overall is sleep. No one okay. ever talks about sleep. And it's just, especially, it's yeah, that. especially today where, I mean, with all this technology and, you know, don't even get me started. I, I work nights. So, you know, I'm going to bed, you know, usually around like 4 a.m. most nights. And it's very hard to go to sleep when the sun's coming up on most of these nights. And it's funny where most of my guests are getting up at around like 4 or 5 a.m. to go work out. You know, I'm going to bed. But what does your sleep schedule look like? And especially when you're on your preps, how are you able to function? Because I know a lot of times, especially with the amount of training and the amount of restrictions that you put on yourself, you're not going to be able to get that proper amount of sleep. So are you just basically a coffee addict then? Not really. No, I basically I am on schedule. My schedule is very planned out, especially when I'm prepping for competition. I make it I mean, down to my meals. I mean, I wake up, I eat at as soon as I wake up, I have my breakfast, my shake, whatever. And then a couple, three hours later, I have I mean, to the T, like everything is planned out. I know sometimes that, you know, you don't um, something comes up and then maybe, you know, you might be behind a little bit on your meals or your sleep or whatnot. But um, I make it a point, especially prepping for a competition that I stick to my schedule. It's very important. So my sleep schedule is the same thing too. Like I, 11 o'clock, that's it. I have to, you know, I'm going to bed. I'm, you know, if, if I have to take a melatonin or something to calm me down and make me go to sleep, you know, it helps. But usually I'm the type of person that I put my head down on that pillow and I'm, I'm good. I'll fall asleep right away. That, that so, must be nice. I have yeah. never been like that. I could, I could go, I've had days where I've, you know, ran for forever and worked out like twice a day. I still can't fall asleep. And I, I basically have to do melt on. And well, as you can tell, I'm a very hyperactive person. That's just how I was born. I've never, I have probably taken about six naps my entire life too. I'm just one of those people where I just, yeah, I know. And, and I've drank coffee probably twice my entire life too. I've, I, I don't, <sighs> hate it so much like even even wake even waking up for this podcast like when you texted me we were getting started a little early i was i'd been up for about like 15 minutes and i was like oh, i just yeah i just don't even need but yeah it just it's it's frustrating for me because yeah with that sleep but yeah if anyone had needs any advice turn off your screens too ahead of time that's one thing that i struggled with especially staying up late and editing these podcasts and uh, on days that i'm not working and next thing you know looking at the clock and be like oh my god it's 3 a.m i should probably get to bed right now so i agree yeah, i agree because i used to sleep with the tv on but i turned the tv off now and i shut everything off and the next thing you know i'm out but yeah i'm fortunate enough that i fall asleep you know i know a lot of people that you know struggle with that and thank god you know i i'm not one of those people thank god now, this question is the bane of my existence. I hate it more than life itself <laughs> is cardio. I hate it more than, you know, I've had some runners on this podcast where it's like, what kind of sick mind do you have where you actually enjoy that and you actually, you know, make it as your life's goal? But 
you know, the only, the only weird thing is with, with this pandemic, I've had so much more free time where I've been doing, you know, like I used to do like a hundred minute cardio sessions where I just walk on it and get like nine miles. But I, I ran out of movies to watch. Cause that's the only thing that would keep me entertained is watching movies. And I, I, I did it for like 50 days. And then next thing you know, I was like, I have no more movies to watch to keep myself entertained. But what is your relationship with cardio? Like as your, you know, the cycle of prep and off season really comes to fruition. It's my least favorite. That's for sure. I love, you know, lifting. But listen, it's it's something you got to do. I don't really think of it like, I mean, yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. You know, but, you know, I wake up in the morning uh, and I do my fasted cardio. That's the first thing I do. I'll do 30 minutes of that. Um, then I'll go and, you know, do my workout. And then after that, I'll do another 30 minutes. Um, but on leg days, usually I don't do cardio at all, you know. Cause it just, oh, that's just, that's just asking, that's just asking for pain right there is doing yeah. Like, yeah. You know, you go through so much when you do legs anyway. So, I mean, so it's not, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, and that's my opinion. Some people may, you know, may think different, but that's what works for me. But yeah, I, I don't believe that you really got to go. I mean, I hear of people doing two hours of cardio a day. I mean, that's, I think it's a little too much, but then also it depends how, you know, how how much fat you have on your body, how much, you know, I, I stay relatively lean because I don't want to put myself through that torture. You know what I mean? Even on my off season, I make it a habit to do my cardio, not as much as I do when I'm on prep, but I, I like to stay very close, not, you know, not too far off of my stage weight or, you know, so that I don't have to work so much, you know, when it comes to when it's time that I have to do get ready for a show with all this podcasting and the, I haven't worked out for really like a month now. And with all this podcasting that I've done, yeah, I, I would have to do about the two hours of cardio for at least a couple of weeks to get myself back into the, into the shape, which is what I'm actually planning on doing starting next week in November. I'm one of those weird people where it's like, if I start a workout or if I start like a, a whole new thing, it's gotta be like either, either the first of the week, the first of a month, the first of it. I'm just one of those people. And when I get started working out too, if I'm planning to work out like at seven o'clock at night and it's seven Oh one, Oh, I got to wait until it's a round number. So I got to wait until it's like seven Oh five or seven ten. I'm just weird. OCD. That's the only thing that I'm weird. OCD about too. Like anything else I could start at any time, but yeah, that's, that's just, and I think that's, that goes a lot with bodybuilding too. But one thing that is, you know, it's never really talked about outside of bodybuilding because no 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 one would be familiar with it is posing and i always say that posing for so many of these athletes is the hardest thing it's harder than your nutrition it's harder than your working out that's why that's why i almost laughed my butt off when you said that you wanted to just start bodybuilding because you thought it would just be so easy to walk up on that stage and get the moment you said that i was like oh god posing must have really bitter really hard but i like to compare it now to being like a perfect driver where you can be a great driver you can never be a perfect driver you can be a great poser you can never be a perfect poser it's always ever evolving what has your experience with posing been like that is my weakness mm -hmm. that is my weakness i mean it's just it's hard it's harder than than most workouts i mean it really like i do my posing three times a week with a coach and then i do it on my own um when i you know whenever i find the chance or you know the time to do it but um, that it's just very hard. It's it hurts, and you know, especially when you're close to a competition, and you know, you start cramping up and everything. But you know, you have to be able to stand in front of those judges, and not shake, and you know, show them that you're weak or you know. But it's it's tough for me. That's that's one of the hardest things for me. It's you know, and not that feeling your muscles too. Wow, like uh, that's another thing as as far as mind muscle connection too. When you're posing, um, if you don't feel it. You can't hit that pose correctly. Like I have a, I have trouble um, when I do my back double bicep, like my glutes and my hamstrings, you know? So it's like, I, I don't, for some reason, I can't feel it when I'm trying to squeeze my hamstrings. So I struggle with that. It's a struggle for me. Well, that's another thing that people don't understand is that it's a whole body flex, basically. When you say back double bicep, everyone just thinks, oh, I just got to flex just the back and the bicep. It's like, no, you got to have the glutes. You got to have every your part of your, you got to have your butt. Throat. You got to have your, every single yeah. thing has to be going. Even, even for a front double by, which I mean, if you're asking anyone from front double by, they would just do front. They wouldn't do anything else where it's like, no, your entire body has to be. So that's, and the fact that the, like, like you were alluding to the human body is not designed to be in that flexed of a state for that long of a period of time. We are just not made like that. What was that like for you sort of getting your body adjusted to that? Because if you were to take anyone from the general public and ask them to, you know, like flex on stage, they would probably last for about five to 10 seconds before they'd pass out. But these bodybuilders, you have to do it for minutes. I mean, I've gone backstage after shows and girls are passing out. 
falling down to the floor because they can't breathe or, you know, because of holding the poses. I mean, I, I, sometimes those judges will have you there for a good, I don't know how, you know, minutes, minutes sounds, feels like forever. And you're just shaking. I mean, you're, but you're trying to control that shaking and you're cramping, but you got to fight through that cramp as it hurts like hell, but you got to fight through it. That's just part of it. I mean, even when you're off to the side and, you know, they're comparing the other girls, you still have to sit on the side flexing because they're still judging you no matter what. When you're on that stage, I mean, it's on until you get off the steps of that stage and walk backstage. So it's, it's tough. That's one of the toughest things in body, in my opinion, in bodybuilding. Well, and smiling too. People don't understand yeah. that you, yes, <laughs> that is one. We've actually had guests on here that said that they've been told by the judges that they lost points because even like when you said, when you're not even the center of attention, when you're just off to the side, they let their smile down for like 10, 15 seconds. And the judges notice that and they docked them a couple points and, People don't understand that for a lot of these shows, your jaw muscles are the most sore thing after that show just because you're smiling the entire time. And it's that's another part or of like the process. You're doing your, for example, for women's physique, you're doing a routine. You're so concentrating on the next move that you have to do because you rehearsed it so many times that you forget to smile. And they look at that. It's, I mean, when they're judging you for every little thing, I mean, if these girls are that good and they're judging you as far as down to the smile, you know, you better make sure you have that smile on, you know? So it's everything counts. Yeah, it's it in that's just that's just all the little things that add up that the general public, like I told you before, they just assume that oh, they just work out all the time, they go on stage and they pose, but it's just so many things that are just not understood, which is why I love to do this podcast to help bring some knowledge to a lot of people. But you said that your back double by is a pose that you really struggled with. What is your favorite pose to do? Well, oddly enough, that's my best I mean, it's because my back is so good. But my lower, my, my glutes and my hamstrings lack a little bit. But I love doing the back double bicep because my back, when I turn around, people are like, oh, my God. You know, I have a lot of depth on my back. And I love to show it off. That's my favorite pose, the back double. As hard as it is, it's my favorite. What's your least favorite pose? <sighs> I mean, I don't know if I have a least. But, I mean. We get abs and thighs almost all the time. There you go. Yeah. Abs and thighs. That's yes. I hate that because it's like weird. They're like, it's kind of tricky. It's not just showing your abs. You got to let the air out and flex your quad at the same time and not crunch them because if you crunch them, then you lose, you can't see them as it's, it's, that. Yeah. That's my least favorite. It's just, it, it's just not a natural looking pose either. I mean, it's like, it's hard to make it look, you know, just naturally in, I mean, yeah, that's one thing that if they could find uh, any way to make it look better where it's not like, cause the, the, the competitors look like they're suffering too, whenever they do it too, just cause you all, you're all like crunched up and it's, yeah, it's just not a natural looking thing. So if they could find some way to fix that, but a question that I ask all my guests on the podcast, whether they be my up and coming bands and musicians or my bodybuilders for my bands, I always ask, you know, what is that feeling like when you get to go on stage and perform live in front of hundreds to thousands of people that also applies to the bodybuilders. What is that feeling like for you when you get to walk up on that stage, you know, finally all those months upon months of hard work that you've put into it, you're finally able to show off all that hard work. It's amazing. It's the best feeling in the world. And that's what keeps me going, you know, because finally you can show these judges how hard you work. This is, this is what I work so hard for, you know, and the feeling is amazing. You know, you just get up there and you, you, you know, you see the crowd, you see them, but you don't see them because you're in your zone. You, basically, you're looking at the judges and you see them paying attention to every little move you make. I mean, I love the whole process of get up to it, preparing for a show. But that that minute that you just walk on stage and your music goes on, it's just it's a great feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. I mean, well, it's like, yeah, it's like, that's all you, that's, I mean, that's, that's all the hard work and why I appreciate this sport even more than a lot of other sports too, is because like, if you're an athlete in any other sport, like I was a baseball player, I'm going to be on that mound, you know, for, you know, like 20 times a year for, you know, like three hours at a time. Whereas bodybuilders, maybe a handful of times a year, you'll be on stage for a couple of minutes each and you're training even harder than I ever trained for any sport that I ever compete in. Just so it's, it's that delayed gratification that a lot of other sports don't have where it's just so much hard work and so much training for just such a little amount of time that you're on stage. It's, it's really just, yeah, it's, it's really just admirable. But when you're on that stage, does time really seem to slow down or does it seem to speed up or is it somewhat of a mixture? It's a mixture. Cause sometimes I walk off stage. I'm like, my God, that was so quick. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, 
it, it, it goes by really fast. It really does in a blink of an eye. But that time that you're backstage waiting to get on is like an eternity. <laughs> it seems like forever because you're so nervous, you know, and it never, you, you're always nervous no matter how many shows you do. You know, you, I always get the butterflies. I always get that nervous feeling. I always thought that, you know, oh, this will get easier. The stage, I'll get more familiar with the stage and I'll be less nervous. That's not the case. I'm nervous, just as nervous every single time. Last year, when I did the Olympia, I mean, I got on the stage and I literally was a deer in headlights when I looked at the judges and I completely forgot my routine. And I was like, oh my God, this is like not the time to forget your routine. This is what you work for. These are all those shows that led up to this. And, but it's okay. I was just happy to be there that I just, you know, that my goal for that year was to step on that stage and, and I accomplished my goal. Well, and that's prep brain 101 for you, basically, when she's talking about forgetting. Because I've had some people that are just like you, where they're like, I am nervous every single time. And then I've, I've had other people be like, I am just so tired that I really could care less when I walk on this. I just want to get it over with because my mind you is just so out of it. Yeah. Too. yeah. If they're yep. tired like that, you have to suck it up mm-hmm. because you can, they can tell. So, yeah, it's, I mean, why well, I even interviewed people like a couple of days before their show and you can tell they're like, they're just about to, you know, pass out and you're just like, Oh my, I you just, you just feel so bad for them. But now we go on to a fun question. What is your go-to post-show meal that you like to have after every show? Um, I love Mexican, I guess, because, you know, you cut out the salt and everything. So I crave everything salty. I, it used to be sweets, but um, not anymore. I'm, I, I guess I've gotten used to not eating as many sweets, but now it's just like tacos and margaritas, <laughs> the salt, sometimes sushi. Yeah. I'm, this is a question there. I mean, this is an answer that's going to make most of my listeners hate me, but I am just, I'm too pale for Mexican. Like it just doesn't sit well in my stomach. I, I just, I, I mean, I'll have, I'll have a quesadilla and I'll have margaritas too, but like, that's, that's about as high. I mean, I've had, I've tried some things and it's just way too spicy for me. I've tried Indian food. That's even worse for me. That was like, that was like, my stomach was about to explode. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm never doing this again, but yeah, it's, and you got to look forward to those cheap meals just because, or, and those meals after the show, just because for some people, that's the one thing that's, that's keeping them hanging on. But what was that experience like when you won your pro card? And I'll just give a little backstory for everyone. You know, for a lot of these competitors, winning their pro card is the highlight of their career, just because that's the affirmation that they've worked, you know, their butt off for. Now we have some guests like Jeannie, Jeannie here, who, you know, literally their first couple of shows, they win their pro card, but we've also had the other guests that, you know, wait like 20 years. But what, what was that moment like for you when they called your name, especially for physique? And you're like, Oh my God, I'm a pro now. Well, I mean, I was very new to the sport. So like, mind you, like I said, I did one show, my second show, that national show was my second show. And that's when I got my pro card. So I literally was on stage and I didn't even know what was going on. And I got off stage and I didn't even know where I placed. So I didn't know, cause you know, you're up there, you look, you look, you don't know, they move you around. Sometimes you get confused and you don't know exactly what's going on, especially if you're you know new to it. So I got off a stage and I walked off and everybody said, oh, hey, congratulations. I'm like, okay, thank you, thank you. Then I went to my husband right away. He's like, you got your pro card. I'm like, I did. That, so, I mean, it's funny, you know, but I, I was so new to the sport. But after that, when it sunk in, I was like, oh, my God, I cannot believe, you know. Then I was like, when's the next show? <laughs> he missed the prime time for a joke. He could have been like, you got in last place and then waited until like the end of the night to finally right? tell you like you got your pro. See, but you know, hey, I don't want to mess with someone who's that depleted and that strain because you never know. You never know what's going to happen. So, you know, he, he he made a smart move that that time, I guess. But now we go on to something that's, I mean, it's impacted all of our lives in more ways than we ever could have thought is the pandemic that's been happening because, I mean, it's it's really just, you know, changed the way that we live our lives, at least for now. And it's just, it's really been just so fascinating and I found that so many people's experiences on this podcast have been different, but especially with the bodybuilders, I mean, it's their experience is really, you know, a category in and of itself, because when you live and die in the gym and these gyms shut down and all this other oh, stuff they happens, that away from you, it's the worst. Yeah. yeah. So what was your experience like, especially in the early stages of the pandemic when everything was shut down? Well, I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I, I own my own gym so I can um, continue with my training but at the same time, you know, it was very worrisome because of, you know, clients and the business end of it too, you know, but I mean, it's a very, it's a small gym, so it's a private gym too. So actually we never closed the gym. So we kind of kept it, you know, uh, one-on-one with clients and they would come by appointment. But as far as me, I was very fortunate, you know, I kept my working on my, um, doing, just staying on track with my, with my workouts and everything. So 
um, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate. Well, you're also fortunate to be in Florida too, where the laws were a little bit more relaxed than they were up here in Minnesota, where we had to wait until literally like July for things to really start opening up up here. Oh my gosh. But yeah. yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was lucky where, so I, so this is a funny story. So I had just moved out of my parents' house. I'm 26 years old. I had moved out in January and I was like, finally saved up enough money. See you later. I'm never coming back. Two and a half months later, I moved back in because of the pandemic because, because my job was furloughed. I couldn't afford to, you know, stay at the place. So I was just, oh my God. So yeah, but luckily my parents do have a a nice setup downstairs where they have a treadmill. They have a couple of weight, they have a couple of weight sets. They have a few, they have like a bench. They have a few other things. So I was able, it's not enough stuff to like grow, but it's enough to maintain and maybe grow just a little bit. So at least what you built, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I was lucky that way, but yeah, I know so many friends were I, I had one buddy who he just went on like the push up, pull up and sit up diet where he did like yeah. 700 of them a day. But here's the thing. He bruised his rib because he was doing them. So doing so many of them that yeah. his, he literally, oh, he was doing so many crunches that at one point he's like, Oh, my rib kind of hurts. And then he went into the doctor and like, Oh yeah, you bruised it. You can't work out for like the next couple of weeks or so. So you gotta yeah. be, you gotta be careful with that. But were there any food shortages down there? Cause up here we had a lot of meat shortages just because what well, was funny. Oh cause God, yes. yes. Cause so we had it up here because the farmers, um, since they couldn't ship them out much, the turkeys and the pigs were growing too fat. They couldn't fit in the thing that they put them in to harvest the meat. So they literally had to like, just take care of them early on. So, but what was the food shortage like down there? Definitely meat too. And, and, and produce everything. And then, then the prices went up crazy high too. So yeah. I, I, I mean, people were, you would go like, say, I don't know if you guys have like uh, Costco and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Yep. You have that. So, I mean, there was no meat. You know, but luckily enough, I found this uh, like restaurant depot, you know, and, um, you, you know, I guess you buy the membership card and we went and we loaded up the freezer with meats and stuff like that. So, but, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was crazy what was going on, but I, you know, you, you know what it was like. It was terrible. Well, I, I looked out cause I live, well, I live in the suburbs of Minnesota. So literally like that George Floyd thing that I, that was 15 minutes away from where I live. Like wow. I, was, I was that close, but so I live in the suburbs, but there's still a lot of hunters around here. So literally our neighbors right behind oh, okay. us, our neighbors right behind us, he has seven or no, not seven. No, is I'm trying to think it's either six or seven, but he has six or seven freezers filled with venison basically that he's hunting. Oh, wow. So <laughs> he was stocked for, I mean, at least like four or five years worth of meat. So we, we would literally, I'd literally just walk over there and he'd be like, Hey, you need some venison? And I'd be like, yeah. And he just toss it to me. And yeah. So I, I lucked out with that, but yeah, we had a ton of, and, and people were jacking up the prices on gym equipment too. Like we had a lot of bodybuilders on where they didn't have any gym equipment. And that's like, next thing you know, Oh, something that was selling for 200 bucks before the pandemic, they're offering a thousand dollars now for it now. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it really is unfortunate, but how did you also deal with all this all mentally too? Cause so many people are talking about, you know, how it affected them physically, whether it comes to their job or, you know, even their health and fitness or just their well being. but no one really talks about the mental side effects. How'd you deal with all this mentally? Cause I can remember even for myself, Early on in this stages, I mean, it looked like things were going to get very, very bad, like a lot worse than they actually got. And it started to look bleak for me where even I was like, why am I even doing a podcast anymore? Like, what's the point of it? But what was this all like mentally for you? I mean, it was very stressful. Like I said, and, you know, we had the gym with the business, so we didn't know if we would have to close. And, you know, so it's scary because, you know, our income and everything like that. And I also do like a meal prep service, too. So as far as like the meats and stuff like that, I couldn't cook for these people. So I had to put that on hold. So that was less income as well. So that was stressful in a way too. So, I mean, just like everybody else, we were, we were, you know, pretty stressed out about it, you know? So, but thankfully we, you know, we cruised through it and we did, you know, knock on wood, we did, we did good. We were able to keep the gym open so that we can survive, you know? So, but was stressful how did the pandemic affect your show schedules too because i know a lot of people like some people even had shows that were they were getting ready for that were in march or april and everything got canceled yes, but what was that, that one was one of, yep, yep. i was one of them i was doing the arnold um uh i was prepping for the arnold and um basically they were going to cancel the arnold they canceled the expo so those people lost a ton of money and was i was gonna just, say for anyone out there a lot of these bodybuilders make the bulk of their money from the expos as opposed to the yes, shows that'd be absolutely yeah. yeah i had a couple of jobs there too that i was gonna do while i was there and um you know we already bought our tickets and everything and then they canceled the npc but they didn't you know but we didn't know if they were going to cancel the pro shows at the end they didn't cancel the pro shows but we flew there we were already there so we didn't know if they were going to cancel on us, but thank God they didn't. We went through with the show. It was a little strange because, you know, the audience was, there was very little audience and the whole 
atmosphere and the whole vibe there in Ohio is just strange. So, I mean, you know, we got through that. That was strange. And then, we, you know, we just waited to see what shows were available because they canceled show after show after show. So, um, you know, that you could, we're kind of in limbo. Like, what do we do now? So we just said, we'll wait for a little bit. And, you know, if the, if the Tampa Pro was going to, you know, happen, then I was going to, that was going to be my next show. So thankfully that happened and I ended up doing that show. And that was in August. I mean, I know people that were on prep basically from March until now almost because they just didn't know because everything kept getting canceled. So yeah, I could I couldn't imagine how frustrating that would be because you know you get so prepped up for a show and then all of a sudden you know some some of these shows even like a week in advance they'd let you know like oh hey we're canceled and delayed. So yeah, it's just a frustrating. I stayed on prep since the Arnold because I I I wanted to qualify for this year's Olympia. So I I was just waiting for whatever show was going to be open so that I can jump in and do it. I was just okay whatever whatever comes up I'm doing it. So, yeah. And you also mentioned that your husband is your coach as well, which makes for an interesting dynamic because it's, 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 uh, we've had that combination is actually a lot more frequent than a lot of people think of where it's usually like husbands and wives. Cause most of them, most of the time your spouse is within bodybuilding as well. That's at least what I've found with my guests where it's, it's basically like half and half, but what is that like having your spouse be your coach? Because it really seems like it's, it, is it hard for you to sort of leave a work life balance kind of then, where as opposed to, you know, when you have someone that you work with all the time, then also being your spouse. It's funny. Everybody always asks me that question, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. We just have such a schedule, you know what I mean? Everything just flows because everything's on a schedule. So I feel very fortunate for, you know, for him to be my coach and my husband at the same time. Whereas, you know, that's one less expense I have to pay because you know how expensive these coaches can be too. So um, on, on that aspect, and then I have him 24 seven. So if I have a question, I don't have to wait. He's right there and he's hands on. So. I think it's great. I mean, we, we get along great. We understand, he understands what I need to go through. Whereas, like you said, there's couples maybe that if um, the, the husband or the wife are not into bodybuilding, that's, that's a very tough relationship to be in, in my opinion, because if you're not in it with them, if you can't relate or know what it, what, what you need from that person or, you know, as far as being supportive or as far as understanding just, you know, or accepting that lifestyle you know, it, it can take a toll on a relationship. So I, I think, I mean, I, I think I'm very fortunate. Have you and your husband ever prepped at the same time? No. I was going to say that's a conundrum in and of itself. Then it's like, if, if you're, yeah, <laughs> I've had, I've had two times where that's happened on the podcast where I've asked them if they did and they're like, yes. And I was like, how is that? Like, how are you even able to function? Cause every, for anyone that isn't aware, when you are on your, your prep brain, I mean, your brain is mush. I mean, you are literally, you know, you must have, you lose at least half your IQ points and it, you're just literally just a walking zombie really because you're just so depleted. So if you ever see, hear of anyone having both the people being in their prep brain, it's like, I want to meet them so I can get them to sign over like their social security number to me and like give me their bank accounts and everything. Cause they would, they, I just be like, what is it? And they'd be like, Oh yeah, here it is. But yeah. So that's, that's fascinating. But do you have any, do you have any fun prep brain stories? Cause I eat those up because I just, I just find it so fascinating. Is there any times that like you've forgotten car keys or anything? Have you ever had like any of those moments that a lot of people talk about? Oh my gosh. All the time. <laughs> I think of which one is like the funniest one. How about trying to take my son to go to school, but I comp I forgot him at home and I drove to the school. I mean, <laughs> at least I didn't forget him at the school. At but least like, hey, I, I bet he loved that though. I bet he I, I bet he was laughing his butt off about that though. I that'd be no, he was on his computer. He didn't even know what was going on. So <laughs> it's like you know. But I got to the school and the lady opens up the car door for the carpool, and she's like, well, "Where's Bodie?" And I'm like, "Oh shit, I forgot him. <laughs> I'll be back." I yeah. <laughs> I had the only moment that I have in my life that could compare to anything like prep brain is that I was at UPS and they had for like our special like seasonal thing. I had to work a 24 hour shift straight of like loading trucks with boxes and stuff. So at the end of it, you know, I had, I have, I had like a step counter on me just to see how many steps I did. I think I was up to 85,000 steps, I think for, for the day, just for doing that. So I was walking to my car. And I was like, oh my God, where are my car keys? Where are my car keys? I started to freak out. They were in my hand the entire time that I was looking oh for God. them. So oh, I was like, as, as soon as that happened, I was like, yeah, that's prep brain. That's, 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 that's my one prep brain moment. But I was going to bring it up at the end here because we have a few questions left that you are a mom. So I mean, just living this lifestyle and being a mom, that's a difficult thing in and of itself because I always say being a mom, that's a full-time job in and of itself. But how are you able to balance? Every I mean, I know you said your strict schedule, but I mean, still, 
having a, having a son or having a kid too. I mean, that's just fundamentally, it makes things harder for a lot of our guests. How do you, how are you able to do, go through this? I mean, my husband is absolutely amazing. He takes on that role. Sometimes when I'm on prep like that, he understands, you know, I mean, I pick him up from school, do things. I mean, and also like your patience is a little, it runs a little thin when you're on uh, prepping for a show and everything. So, you know, sometimes I, I'll just tell him, you know, Hey, mommy's not feeling too good today. It's one of those days. And they know. But he's just go in your room, play video games all day. Just like, leave, leave mom anyway, alone. So yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he loves his video games, but he, I mean, he goes with me to every show. He travels with us to every show. So he knows the routine already. He's the easiest kid ever. He's just, he's awesome. What do you think his opinion is on having a mom that could beat up all the other moms at his school? I don't know if he really, I mean, he's around it so much to him. It's like normal. So, but when he gets another kid that has never seen me before, then he sees their reaction and he's like, you know, then he, for example, yesterday um, we were at the gym and he's sitting at the front desk and this, uh, one of the clients came and brought their son. And I, you know, introduced my son to the little boy and he's like, wow, your mom has big muscles. She's really strong. He's like, yeah, I guess she is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I guess, I guess she could. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's, I think it's different with a lot of people that, you know, they've experienced it a lot of their lives as opposed to some guests that I've had on with their kids where they had just been doing it for a couple of years and their kids were like 13 when they started. And then they're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. But how important is it for you? Because I mean, there've been so many studies that have been released that, you know, if you have parents that are in shape, it is vastly more likely to take impact with your kids and help them, you know, stay in shape the rest of their lives. Because especially with this obesity crisis, how important is it for you to set that positive example for your son so that, you know, he's able to grow up and, you know, say, you know, like, Hey, I've, I have the tools and I've seen it firsthand that, you know, you can be at sh in shape at any age and there's no excuses really. I mean, I haven't really had that conversation with him as far as like, it's just, he sees me doing what I do and he wants to do the same thing. Like um, he talks about it himself, actually. He's like, well, we got to eat healthy. We can't eat sugars because sugars are not good for you. I mean, he'll, he'll have his sugars. Of course it's not, you know, but he just, by looking at, you know, our lifestyles, he, he kind of like, you know, he gets it. He, you know, and he, he has his little, you know, treats here and there, but he's very focused on eating healthy and okay, you got to eat vegetables, you got to eat your proteins and, you know, but it's, I mean, I, I would think it would be great if he learned from it, you know, and I'm not necessarily become a bodybuilder, oh, yeah, but, yeah. you know, learn, you know, the nutritional part about it or, or the importance of um, um, exercising, you know, so that you're healthy. Because I think nowadays with kids too, they they don't get enough exercise or, you know, it's not like when I was growing up that we were forced to, you know, have PE outside or we would play outside until the sun came down, you know? So I think it's very important. I mean, I hope that he learns from it and I think he is. Yeah. I mean, I can remember, I might've been like the last age group where like we actually went outside and, you know, just hung out basically until like the street light came on and, you know, that's, that's when you come home. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that, that has ended, but if we were to talk to you a year from today, now, again, I ask this from everyone that I've already had on the podcast for a second time. I always tell them if the first time that you came on, if I would have asked if, where would you like to be at a year from now, if you would have predicted a global pandemic and anything and everything that's going on right now, I would have bet my entire life savings against it. So I ask this question knowing full well that there is no way that I know what the future entails because we could be talking a year from today and there could be a huge fire behind me and you could hear like gunshots going on in the background. Who knows? Who knows what the world's going to be like a year from today? But in an ideal world, where would you like to be at a year from today when it comes to just your overall bodybuilding career when it comes to just your overall life what are some goals that you'd like to have achieved by the time we talk a year from today well I mean as far as my bodybuilding career I mean I'm hoping I mean I'm going to the Olympia this year which I'm so grateful for and um I would like you know maybe to place better ne at next year in the Olympia, maybe to be in the top five. I don't know. That would be in the Olympia. That's my bodybuilding career. And, you know, to win an overall in a show would be amazing. Those are my bodybuilding um, goals. As far as uh, your life itself, I mean, um, my business, my, my gym, I mean, it's pretty new. I've had it for a year. Thank God it's been going well, but, you know, to expand and, you know, grow my clientele and, and you know, and just, you know, to get out there a little bit more in the, in the bodybuilding world and, you know, to, to, for people to know and actually help people, um, 
like you do understand more, a little bit more about bodybuilding and about being healthy or, you know, eating right, you know, guiding people the right in the right direction. I, I love doing that because, you know, I, 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 being a bodybuilder, people ask you a lot of questions. Oh, my God. You know, yes. and I love that because people think maybe sometimes I'm unapproachable because I don't know why I guess I'm intimidating, but I'm so not like that. But I love helping people. You know, and through my gym, I can do a lot of that. And, and I'm grateful for that, too. So I'd like to see that. That is by far the biggest stereotype that we go through on this is that they think that people are unapproachable just because they look big and just because they're they're muscular. But I found, you know, that Bibles are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet on the planet. And all you got to do is go up to an ass. Now, again, if they're in the gym and they're mid set, don't go up and talk to them, because I mean, a lot of people sometimes make that mistake and they get that wrong first impression. But yeah, and you honestly led me into my second to last question that I always love to ask is, you know, let's be honest, you're not the average looking woman. Like if you were to walk out on the street dressed like you are right now, you are going to get looks and stares just because it's human nature when they see something that's not of the normal, just to be like, oh, wow, that's that's interesting. What has that been like for you? Because, I mean, even in your CrossFit days, you probably got a lot of stares and looks, but how, is, how has that evolved and has it gotten to a point where you're just so used to it that it doesn't affect you? Or what has that transformation been like? Because you're, I like to compare it to being like a mini celebrity where, I mean, you, you're, it's, just, it's just fascinating for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I embrace it. I, I, if it's in a positive way, I love it. I mean, some people will come up, oh, my God, your muscles, can I touch your arms? Okay, sure, you know, whatever. If it's done, you know, in a nice way or, you know, they're admiring it. I mean, you know, I mean, that's awesome. I love that they admire that. But if it's, you know, if they look at me in a, in a way like, oh, my God, she's a freak or something like that, I just look the other way. I'm used to it. I just brush it off. I mean, to me, that's somebody that doesn't, I mean, you don't have to love bodybuilding, but you don't have to be mean you know, if you see a bodybuilder and it, and it's not your normal, because it's not your normal doesn't mean that it's not right, you know. So, but I, I mean, I don't mind it. I most for the most part, I have always gotten really positive uh, people coming up and just you know admiring you know the way that I look and just you know asking me what I can do or what what uh, what the what they can do as far as you know help them with you know give them some guidance or you know. But uh, I don't mind it, not at all. I went to uh, visit my sister in Denmark, and that was where I felt it the most. And I felt, I didn't know if it was in a positive way or in a negative way, but she lives in a small little village like four hours away from Copenhagen. And here comes this girl, dark skin, muscular, you know. I was going to say, you stick out especially like a sore thumb in Denmark, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, people looked at me like I fell out of the sky, like I was, and I felt a little uncomfortable there. Because, I mean, I don't know, they won't come up and approach you. They just look at you, you know. That I, I am mainly Norwegian, so I get that totally with like that. That's just the whole Scandinavian culture where they're just so reserved. And yes. they, if you walk up and, and say hi to them, they're just like, what? Like, what the hell? Like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. So it's, yeah. I would almost prefer for them to come and ask yeah. me and say something instead of that look. But yep. then I understand it's a different culture and everything. Then I went to a gym there and everybody just stopped what they were doing and they stared at me. But I was like, you know, I went on doing my thing and I was like, okay, whatever. You so know. the million dollar question, what is your sister doing in Denmark? Um, she married a, a Danish fellow. She's been married and she, she's been living there for like 15 years already. She's a nurse over there. She's doing really well. That's yeah. awesome. Like, yeah, like I said, yeah. I, have a, I, I have a lot of Norwegian blood in me. So it's always been one of my goals is to go back to the homeland and, you know, check it out. But uh, we, I've, I haven't gone back there yet, but I just, I hear it's absolutely you have to beautiful. Go. Norway's beautiful. Oh, too. with the fjords too and everything. That's my dream is to go and see some of those. Yeah. It's, yeah, I cannot, I cannot wait for one day that I'm, that I'm going to be able to do that. But now this is my favorite question to ask is, you know, if someone were to walk up to you and say, hey, we made the decision, you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? Oh, wow. See, I saved I saved the hard questions for the end here. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I've never thought of that. I mean, I love everything about bodybuilding. I just... um I'm even more so now because they're embracing it so much more. Women's bodybuilding has become a lot more that that's a hard question. I never thought of that. I mean, if I can change something. I'll give you my answer first then while you think about it then. So like one thing that I hear all the time that I agree with too, it's, well, it's a two parter for me is first of all, the pay is make it more so that these people aren't basically like living in poverty. If they just compete in bodybuilding, make it more incentivized, but also on that, on that effect, don't give them way too much. We're like, could you imagine what, 
the people would look like or the guests would look like if they offered like a $20 million prize for like the Olympia and stuff like you would have guys that wouldn't be able to fit through doors basically walking in there and just like, yeah, that the extremes that people would go to would not be, that would not be something that I think would be right very good for them but still give them more money where they're able to you know live people should be able with the dedication that this sport requires people should be able to do it for a full-time job and they should be able to live healthily if they're good in the sport too just that's one thing but also to the judging i mean every sport is prone yeah every sport is prone to human error believe me being a baseball pitcher i know that more than most dealing with some of these umpires where you're just like what the hell but We've heard so many stories on here, people who they might compete in shows in back to back weeks or even like a week break where in the first show, they're like, oh, we want you a little bit more of a leaner look. The next show, oh, we want you in a little bit more of a fuller look. It's like, well, it's going to be it's going to be hard for me to change that look in a week. So that those are the two things that I hear of all the time. And I agree with completely. OK, I totally agree with you. I didn't think of it like that. But yes, exactly that. The pay. Yes, definitely. Because, I mean, we devote our lives every minute of our lives, you know, to this. So why not get paid for it? And I'm not, like you said, not anything crazy, but maybe it would be, you know, nice to, you know, to be rewarded a little bit better. I'd say at least triple or quadruple what they have right now at at least. And and men's and women's is so much more unfair than it is even in like real life. So I'd say make the men and women's more equal at least. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, like exactly the same or even more than the same. But the women's division, it's it's different. For example, figure women get more money. Bikini girls get more money than the physique women. Whereas bodybuilding women get a lot more because of the wings of strength. He just... He pays them. He pays them really well. That, that's one thing that I was going to mention too. Yeah, if you are a bodybuilder, yeah, you are going to get that. That is a fair deal. Yeah. And that's why most women, for example, in my category, are jumping to women's uh, bodybuilding because of the pay. I do it because I love the sport. So I mean, I love women's physique, and that's where I fit in right now. If I move up later on, I want to master this division, and then once I master this, and if I have to move up, I will. If I still want to be doing it, you know, but. Um, I agree, definitely agree with the pay, definitely agree with the judging, because I'll tell you what, just um, the Chicago Pro I did last week, I mean, not last week, uh, or was it two weeks ago? Um, and there was a different set of judges. And then I did the New York Pro and the Tampa Pro. So the Tampa Pro, I placed second, and then the New York Pro, I placed second. So here I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to the, do the Chicago Pro, because I wanted to secure my points for the Olympia. Because I think I'm on the on the list, I was third. So there was one girl that was very close. So I said, okay, I have to do this so that a way I can pass her in the points. Anyways, so I ended up doing the Chicago Pro and I placed six. And I was like, mind you, it's still good. It's still first call outs. I'm not complaining, but they're so inconsistent and they're judging. It's like, I mean, and then I spoke to the judges afterwards and they were like, well, you need to come in harder. I'm like, but the, okay, then the, the girl, the, the girl that won it was much softer. I'm like, I don't get it. But yeah, I'm sure every bodybuilder is going to tell you the same thing that the judging is, you know, yeah, not consistent. It's yeah, it's it's definitely hit or miss, and that's that's one thing that I'd love to see change. But before we wrap things up, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Well, I'd love to give a shout out to my husband. He's and um, Marty Feldman. He's my coach and our gym, Design Performance in Miami. I was just about to ask you what the name of your gym is so I can plug it. So, yeah, everyone, Design Performance yes, in Miami. You. Yes. And um, I want to say thank you to fellow Cabernero. You know him from uh, um, Men's Classic Physique and Maggie, his wife, are amazing people. They help me so much, and I appreciate their help. Um and everybody, everybody, you know, in my gym, all, all my members, they're like family, you know, and everybody that supports me, my fans on Instagram, my, my, you know, IG fans, everybody. I just want to thank you for all your support. Well, absolutely. And everyone go and give her a follow on her Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below. Buy or beware. You will get inspired to get off the couch and stop eating those Twinkies and, you know, yes. start, start to get in shape. But again, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast. I oh really, God, really appreciate absolute. it pleasure absolutely it was fun talking to you well i couldn't think of a better way to end it can you give us a front double buy so that everyone can be embarrassed and want to go to the gym yeah i'd say back up just a little bit so we can get the full view got it wow that? that's that's insane okay we all need to go and work out a little bit more everyone so <laughs> again you guys, you guys. <laughs> yeah again you guys this is ryan johnson dd on the spot signing out have a great day everyone bye guys thank you